Every, yeah, yeah. Well, good evening. I'm glad that you're here. And for those of you uh, joining us on Facebook, uh, we already have a couple of people there. We're glad that you're here as well. Uh, we're going to continue our time uh, together, but as we did last week, and we'll always uh, do this, uh, we'll start with a, a short time of, of prayer. And uh, I did not get in touch with anybody from the uh, prayer group, so we're just going to open it up. Uh, do you have anybody that uh, you would like to mention uh, for us to be praying for? Is there anybody uh, that uh, uh, you've been praying for or somebody that we may not be aware of? If I know all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, uh, how, how's your memory? Uh, we're just going to we're just going to put some things to the test. How many books are there in the New Testament? How many books in the New Testament? Twenty-seven. I, I heard all these different numbers, but nobody said it with confidence. You know, uh, this number, this number. Uh, yeah, there's twenty-seven uh, books in the New Testament. Uh, there are uh, uh, two hundred sixty chapters. Uh, written by nine or ten men, depending on where you stand on who wrote uh, the Hebrew book. Uh, my personal opinion is uh, I like to believe that Paul wrote it uh, and just did not address it. But there are a lot of people who have various uh, other ideas. Uh, there's been at least uh, four major thoughts as to who might have authored Hebrews, and we'll get into that later on in the year. But uh, there's either nine or ten authors. Uh, the New Testament covers approximately a hundred years. Uh, it covers from uh, 4 uh, B.C. when Jesus was born uh, all the way up to when John, uh, around uh, the year 90 A.D., somewhere in that area, uh, wrote the, the Revelation. And uh, here on the, the first page of your notes for this evening, uh, you have the structure of the New Testament. You have the historical letters. You have uh, the, the, the four Gospels, and we'll look at those here in a few minutes just to get a, a better description of them. Uh, then you have the book of Acts. And so you have those five books that give us an understanding. Uh, there's those, uh, the, the Gospel writers give us the history of the birth of Christ, uh, his ministry, how he handled that ministry. Uh, then you have uh, the death, burial, and the resurrection uh, of Jesus. Then you have the book of Acts, and the book of Acts uh, takes us from the, the point of the ascension, uh, where Luke says, I want to give you an honest account, where I have uh, studied thoroughly, and I, I've uh, gone to great depths of, of getting an understanding. And so he begins with the ascension of Jesus, uh, where many were gathered there to watch uh, Jesus uh, give them their marching orders and then uh, ascend into the heavens. And then you have the epistles written by Paul. So you go from Romans uh, to Philemon. Now, Romans, of course, uh, it's self-identifying. It was written to the church and to the Christians at Rome. And Paul always had this deep desire to go to Rome. Does anybody remember why or what the, the, the reason was that he really wanted to go to Rome? Anybody have an idea? Anyone? Because it was the major center of the world. If anything was happening, it was happening in Rome. So that's like uh, today, you know, uh, if Billy Graham were still alive, uh, but those of us who remember Billy Graham, uh, when he went... Uh, to hold huge crusades, he always went to these centers where he knew he'd get great, uh, get the biggest crowds. Uh, L.A. was one uh, where he held one in the Coliseum, and uh, there were literally hundreds of thousands of people throughout that week who showed up uh, to hear the gospel. Uh, just a little tidbit. Uh, I know you came for some little tidbits. Uh, Joe actually got to meet Billy Graham one time. Yeah, I introduced me to him also. I apologized uh, for uh, what she did to him. Uh, but uh, 
we were in Cincinnati. We were at a conference that Billy Graham was hosting, and uh, he chose a certain number of people from small country churches, and uh, we were one of them, and we were there for that conference. Mm -hmm. And we were ready to go out the door, uh, and it was raining, and so she was trying to get her jacket on. She was trying to get her gloves on. She's trying to, you know, get ready for her umbrella when she got out. And it was one of those uh, turntable type uh, doors. And Mr. Graham and some of his entourage came rushing in out of the rain, and Joe did not see him coming. So she ran right smack in his way. And Billy Graham's a pretty good sized guy. And he knocked her straight on her unmentionable. <laughs> I just looked and I thought, boy, oh, he has really big feet. <laughs> and you could tell. <laughs> and he had large hands. And he reached down in that southern draw of his and he said, my goodness, young lady. That was several years ago. Uh, and he said, my, my goodness, young lady, what have I done? And she said, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I said, sir, I'm sorry she got in your way. <laughs> and we had a chance to meet him and talk with him for just a few moments. He, uh, he helped her up. Uh, he helped dust her off a little bit. And uh, we got a chance to tell him who we were and where we were from. And he apologized. <laughs> he apologized several times, but that was our one real encounter. Uh, but we... Uh, we got to uh, sit through some of uh, the seminars that he taught, like I'm teaching tonight, uh, in addition to the, uh, the crusade. But he held, wherever he went, uh, it was where he could get to the masses. That's why Paul had such a longing to go to Rome. Uh, then you have uh, the letters to the churches in these epistles, uh, to Corinth, to Galatia, uh, Ephesus, uh, Philippi, Colossae, Thessalonica. Uh, all of these were uh, written to places where Paul helped to begin churches. Now, Paul's great desire was to see that the church continued to thrive. And so he would go into an area, he'd spend a certain amount of time, we'll look at that when we get to those individual books, but then he didn't leave them barren whenever he would go somewhere else. He would check up on them. He would write back to them. He would see what was going on. And, and if you look at 1 Corinthians, for instance, 1 Corinthians, every single chapter deals with a problem in the church. Every single chapter. And he's identifying those issues and trying to get them to make amends of what they're doing. And then in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians is pretty much a book of encouragement. It's kind of like, here's what you were bound up in, but now you're you're making a turnaround and things are getting better. So it's just kind of like, I saw where you were, now I see where you're going kind of thing. Uh, the book of Galatians uh, is one that where Paul is trying to defend the scriptures, trying to defend the church, trying to get people to understand the values of this book. Uh, we were just talking, joking a little bit ago, uh, our, our world has changed so much. And uh, the things that we once held dear, uh, people don't seem to hold dear anymore. The, the things that used to be really important to us uh, just don't seem to be there uh, anymore. Uh, and that's what Paul was doing. And so when he wrote to Galatia, when he wrote to the people in Ephesus, uh, that's what he was doing. Then he had some very personal letters uh, to his son in the faith, this guy named Timothy, and then a guy named Titus. Uh, he wanted to let them know uh, how much he appreciated them and then challenge them on the future growth and further growth in, in the Lord uh, to be the leaders that they ought to be. And then the, the letter to Philemon uh, uh, about a brother being a brother no matter what his stature is uh, in, in the community. And then you have the general epistles, Hebrews, James, a half-brother of Jesus, uh, First and Second Peter written by Peter, First, Second, and Third John written by John, and then uh, Jude, another half-brother of Jesus. And remember, those individuals before this, uh, before the resurrection, uh, James and Jude did not believe in Jesus as being the Messiah. Uh, they they thought there was something wrong with him. 
Uh, they were not believers or followers uh, by any means in, in those early days. But then they changed. And, and James is a James is one of those books that's a very um, studious book. Uh, it's about real change uh, in in the life and ministry of the individual. And then, of course, the one that everybody likes to talk about from time to time, uh, the Revelation. Uh, I've taught through it a couple of times. Uh, I I won't preach through it. Uh, And and here's the reason. Uh, If I were going to write a book on uh, Revelation, I would entitle Revelation be confused (laughs) because there are so many different variables and so many different viewpoints. And when you're preaching through something, as I mentioned last week, you can't just stop and say, Hey, explain that point again. But when you teach through it, as I did uh, a number of times, uh, at least you can have some discussion, even if you don't agree on the viewpoints. And, uh, even though there's just, uh, you know, 20 something chapters in it, uh, it took over a year to get through it because uh, I would write a lesson as I've done here for this evening, but we've seldom got through a lesson in a night uh, because there was just so much discussion and so many people with differing uh, viewpoints. So here's another test of your memory. Who, Who wants to tell me what their favorite New Testament book is and why? You got a favorite? Anybody? James. James? Okay. There's so much stuff in there, so much good stuff in there. Really practical yeah. stuff, practical application. Over and over and over again. Yeah. Anybody else got a favorite? Anybody? I, I love Philippians. Uh, I just do. I mean, Philippians has uh, so many positive thoughts. And uh, re- Paul was in, in jail. He was handcuffed to dudes uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And yet the, the center theme, central theme of Philippians is joy. And it just reminds us that you can be filled with joy in the sp- in spite of your circumstances. Joy is different than happiness. Happiness is what's going on around you, but joy is what's going on w- from within. And uh, even though he was dealing with persecution and being in prison and being abandoned by the people he thought loved him the most, he still found joy in Jesus. And I think uh, with what we're, the world that we're living in today, uh, that just makes a whole lot of sense. Anybody else have a favorite? Speak up now because we're moving on if you don't. Okay, well, let's look at the Gospels. Uh, we, we looked at them briefly, but let's just, uh, there's several pages. We're not going to look at all of it, but there's several pages just to highlight it. Matthew, we mentioned last week. Uh, well, let me first start, start here. Uh, if you go down about halfway there into what Luke says, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. We talked a little bit about that, uh, that how they see things together or are seen, uh, together. So, uh, they're very similar in their viewpoint and their content, uh, and but uh, John is a lot different. John uh, is writing long after the others were gone, and he admits a lot of things that they had, but it's still uh, worthwhile in, in knowing. But Matthew is about uh, Jesus as king because he was writing to the Jews, and uh, so that's why he has the genealogy in there. That's why he has the messianic uh, credentials in there. Uh, that's why he continues to point to Jesus as uh, the one that God had sent. Mark is about uh, Jesus as a servant. Uh, Mark is probably the gospel that was written first. Uh, he probably wrote it somewhere around 65 AD, uh, approximately. 
So that had been about 30 years uh, after uh, Jesus uh, ascended, uh, somewhere in that general uh, vicinity. And uh, Mark presents Jesus as a servant uh, who came uh, for mankind. And he was trying to get that a point across to uh, those that he had sent this uh, this letter out to. And if you remember, last week we talked about how Mark wrote that in accordance with things that he had learned from uh, Peter. And so that's what made it uh, made the difference. Luke is about uh, Jesus as the Son of Man. Uh, in uh, Luke's viewpoint, he was the perfect man. Uh, the gospel record uh, is is uh, more historical in nature than the others. He he did a lot of deep dives. Uh, he did a lot of searching uh, to bring up evidence. Uh, so he and most people think that uh, when he wrote uh, this letter to Theophilus, it was to an individual that he was trying to share the gospel with. Uh, whenever I meet people and I'm asked to talk to people about uh, becoming a Christian, or I'm asked to talk to people about understanding who Jesus is, you, you have to find out where somebody is in their understanding. And then you take them from that point on. It's kind of like in Acts 8 uh, on the road uh, where uh, uh, Philip meets the Ethiopian eunuch. He found out where he was and he took him from that spot and he took him on to where he needed to be. Well, that's what Luke does uh, and and many have referred to Luke as a literary masterpiece uh, that would appeal to the Greeks uh, like uh, Luke uh, himself. And then John is about Jesus as the Son of God. This one, of course, was the last book written somewhere, like I said, uh, around 90 A.D., somewhere around uh, 100 A.D. Uh, it's the most spiritual book. If you want to know anything about uh, the Gospel of John, uh, that's it. It's the most spiritual of uh, the Gospels. Uh, it's written to all mankind, but it's written with a purpose. The purpose is to understand the spiritual life of Christ and lead people to an understanding of Jesus. Now, let me, let me just say this, uh, and I say it with great uh, uh, love and respect. When, if, if you come across somebody that you're trying to get into the Word of God, if you're, you're, if you're trying to encourage somebody to read the book, don't start out with John. Uh, because that's more for a seasoned, having grown in the faith type of individual. I would suggest you start out with Mark. Because Mark was written to the common man with a common understanding. Uh, Mark was written with with some intensity. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this last week. Mark uses the word immediately a lot. So start out with the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of Luke, one of those two. But uh, Matthew and John has so much digging to do. And for the average individual just starting out getting into the word, uh, there's just too much. Uh, it, it, it's... Um, it's kind of like, have, have any of you, did any of you start the year saying you're going to read through the Bible? Just curious. Anybody, have you ever done that? Have you ever set as a goal in January, I'm going to read through the Bible this year? Anybody? Yeah. How'd you do? How many of you did real good until you got to Leviticus? Or or Numbers? Get to Leviticus or get to Numbers and you get bogged down. And you get so bogged down that you say, well, I'm going to skip this part and go on. Or you get bogged down and you just quit. And then you go through some other type of reading program. Uh, that's what I'm getting at. Uh, if, if you want to get somebody involved in the New Testament, I would suggest uh, Mark or, or Luke because they will help people uh, in a much greater way than trying to start out with Matthew uh, or, or John. Any any ideas or thoughts? Anybody? Any any questions? I know I'm going a little bit quicker 
but there's material there and uh, we didn't, uh, you know, I don't want it, us to get too far bogged down. If you go into the next page, uh, periods in the life of Christ, you see how Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John lines up. One thing that I find really interesting is if you go to the far end there in John, you'll see that the suffering and the triumph written by John goes from chapter 13 to the end of chapter 21. So that's not quite half, but it's the biggest portion of the Gospel of John. He spends the biggest portion on the part that's most significant for us because that's where our foundation lays. See what I mean? John spends a lot of time, he spends a lot of time on Jesus as a servant when he washes the disciples' feet, when he spends time uh, preaching to the disciples about remaining together in unity, when he uh, takes them to the upper room, when he uh, talks to them about uh, that I've come uh, to set you apart, uh, to make a a significant change. Uh, So, John spends a significant amount of his time in the season in which we're in right now as we get ready to celebrate uh, the resurrection, as we get ready for the week of passion. Uh, He spends a lot of his time right there. Uh, The other three, they pretty well have it divided up in in, uh, what I think would be a fair uh, mixture, uh, his time of preparation, uh, in, in Matthew, that, that means we've got the genealogy and this is who Jesus was. And then we have the baptism. Then we have Jesus going into the wilderness. For most of us here uh, tonight or those of you watching on Facebook, you're probably familiar with most of that. Uh, but uh, Matthew kind of hangs out there and then he really hits hard on the popularity of Jesus during his time of ministry which then leads into the opposition. Jesus became so popular that those who didn't like him being popular opposed him and looked for opportunities of getting rid of him. And that happens a lot uh, in in our world uh, as well. Uh, Mark and Luke, they have it fairly well divided. Then there's this little tracker here about what different people throughout history have said uh, about Jesus uh, in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Uh, The different names or the different attributes uh, of Jesus from uh, Deuteronomy and Numbers all the way through uh, to the Old Testament. Uh, And then there in the New Testament from uh, the announcement uh, by the angels that the Lamb of God had come Uh, to the time of the resurrection. So we've got it all uh, from there. But then I leave it with a little question. Who is Jesus to me? That's on page three, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I haven't lost anybody. Who who is Jesus to you? If, If somebody came up to you and just asked you, Okay, I read all these things about this guy, Jesus. You know, that he was born uh, in Bethlehem and laid in a manger and uh, read all these things about perfect life, no sin. And uh, now, you know, people are talking a lot about Easter. But who is Jesus to you? How would you answer? How do you answer that? I would say he knows my name. Oh, I like that. He's always with me. I like that. That's good. He knows who you are. Yeah. Friend, Savior. I like that. How how would you describe him? All knowing. All knowing? Healer. Healer. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because he can heal the emotions. He can heal the physical. uh, He can heal you spiritually. Yeah. 
Anybody else have something that you would say if somebody questions you? Because you see, Peter says, always be ready to give an account for what you believe or what you hold dear. And there will be times that somebody will see something different in you and they'll ask you, well, who is this Jesus? Yeah. How would you describe this Jesus? And what people are looking for is a succinct answer. Uh, they're not looking for you to crack open your Bible and take them from Matthew to the Revelation. Uh, they're looking for you to give them an answer that they can grasp hold of. And so the fact that he knows your name and he loves me, uh, I, I think that uh, think that's a good way of starting. Uh, I also like to add that he loves me in spite of. If you ask my wife, she's got a lot of in spite ofs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jesus loves me or Joe loves me in spite of I don't always find the hamper with my socks. Yeah. And Jesus loves me in spite of the time that I lose my temper. He loves me in spite of the times that I'm not as faithful as I should be or as loving or compassionate. You see, my children grew up learning the fact that marriages are not 50-50. They're not. Because if you think marriages are 50-50, you know what happens? This is part of my counseling thing with young couples. If you think they're 50-50, then what happens is you're always basing things on 50-50, so you're thinking, okay, the last time I gave in, so now it's their turn to give in. And so what I taught my children was that marriages are 100-100, where you care more about your mate's happiness than you do your own. You care more about their happiness than you do your selfishness. And that's where the rub comes in. And that's where the love in spite of comes in. Uh, that so many in our world uh, ha has missed. Uh, Joe was watching a, a show last night or the night before. I don't remember. I was just kind of staying awake and not going to sleep while she was watching it. But I heard this guy... I heard this girl ask this guy, well, how many times have you been married? And he said, well, two so far. <laughs> and then he asked her, he said, how many times have you been married? And she said, I haven't. She said, because marriage is not a just one and uh, try again. For me, marriage is a one and done. You're in it for the long haul. Again, you don't see that much in our world anymore. And when you have those in spite of moments or your pick your battle moments, then you really find out the true test of your love in the same way with Jesus. Sometimes when you read stuff in the New Testament, things that he's asked us to do, you have to make that decision. Do I love him more or do I love me more? And that's where the rub comes in for most of our world. And that's why we see the values changing and the thought process changing and the love for this book changing. So who is Jesus to you? Pretty simple stuff. Any other, before we move on, give you one more chance. Anybody? I just think it's interesting when you you see at the end of the book that the main things that John did omit. Oh yeah, there's a lot of things that John omitted because the other three had already covered it. Yeah. And that's one of the things in preaching that's sometimes tough. Uh most of you know, you most of you have been here long enough to hear me a dozen times or so so far. I rarely say everybody knows something. Because I know the chances are that there's somebody sitting out there who's hearing it for the first time. 
So that's why when I refer to scriptures or stories in the Bible, I'll say most everybody knows this, or probably a lot of you remember this story. Because there's always the chance that somebody is hearing that story for the first time. And John was like, hey, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they've already told these things, so I'm going to move on to something fresh. And that makes a big difference. Some additional thoughts uh, about the gospel. Again, some more filler uh, there for you. But if you go down to the bottom, some personal touches in Luke's gospel. Uh, He had uh, a sympathetic attitude toward the poor, uh, the lowly, the outcasts. Here's writings, material, specifically mentioned by Luke that uh, many we don't find anywhere else. But notice uh, it was directed to those who were kind of thrown by the wayside by the average person, uh, you know, discarded by those who were of the upper crust. And so Luke wanted to make sure that the point was, that he got the point across about sinful people or somebody like Mary Magdalene or... Uh, the deserted beggar, or uh, those who are less fortunate. On the next page, Luke's gospel is a devotional gospel. He emphasizes prayer. I've been toying back and forth about uh, preaching through uh, the gospel of Luke in the next year or so. Uh, But one of the things I've always liked about Luke is his attitude of seeking the Father's will on things, and so Luke, more so than the other two, uh, really puts an emphasis on directly going to the Father uh, for situations. Uh, and so he not only has uh, parables, but he has uh, the prayers that the Lord uh, prayed. Uh, women appear prominently in Luke's writings. Remember, he's the only Gentile, and so he didn't have the same feelings about women that the Jews did. Uh, And so that made quite a a difference. Luke records 20 miracles and only six of those are found in uh, his gospel. uh, Or six of those are found only in Luke. Uh, And uh, and then there are other incidents recorded only by Luke uh, and it goes all the way down there. But notice there's a couple of those that, that we really cling to like Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. Think about it. If Luke hadn't written that down, we'd have missed out on that one. But that always kind of enters in when we're talking about the Lord, the Lord's love for Jerusalem and how uh, broken he was because of their discarding him. Or that uh, he sweat like drops of blood you hardly hear, ever hear the crucifixion without somebody pointing out that the intensity of his prayer was such that sweats beat it up on his brow like drops of blood. Uh, it, yeah, yeah, I think so. The fact of, you know, his occupation, seeing things like that, yeah. Or the I, I particularly like the one there, the walk to Emmaus. Uh, that's one of my favorite passages about the resurrection. When Jesus joins up with a couple of guys as they're heading home to Emmaus. And, and the one point in there where they say, we just knew he was the one. But it wasn't until they sat down and broke bread together that they were just cut to the heart and said, how did we miss this? This is actually Jesus. How how did we miss this? Then uh, Luke records uh, on page six, 23 parables. Uh, 16 of those are only found in Luke. And again, from my perspective, some of those are some of the, the best reading uh, I, I think about the parable of the prodigal son. 
uh, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the persistent widow, the Pharisee and the tax collector, uh, the rich fool, the friend at midnight. I mean, those are awesome stories. And uh, Jesus just said, let me tell you a story. And then he wraps it all up and gives you an understanding. And uh, Luke was sharp enough to include those uh, to help us understand. Any thoughts about either one of those? The miracles or the parables or other incidents or the prayer time that we just jumped over real quickly? Anybody have any thoughts about any of those? You, you have heard probably that Luke 15 is uh, referred to as the lost chapter. Have you heard that before? Luke 15 is referred to the lost chapter because he begins the 15th chapter with the lost sheep where there was one lost and the shepherd goes to look for him. And then he talks about the lost coin and then he talks about the lost son. And each one, as he progresses through there, it becomes more severe and more valuable. And, uh, and so it becomes really important uh, as he talks about all these things that were lost and yet from the perspective of the individual, they were very valuable and had to be found. Anything? Y'all are just not as talkative tonight as you were last week. I know it's a lot to grab hold of, but we need to get on. Any Anything at all? Well, then there's John. Uh, the Gospel of John has many touches that were obviously based on the memories of an eyewitness. Remember, I mentioned this last week. There were 12. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, etc. There, there were 12. But then there were three, Peter, James, and John, who were of the most intimate friendship with Jesus. So Peter, James, and John saw some things that only they saw. There were times that the three came as a witness to certain things, a healing or Jesus praying, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and here I, I just mentioned the house at Bethany being filled with the fragrance of the broken perfume jar. Uh, that's uh, right after uh, the raising of Lazarus. Uh, he admits several significant events in Christ's life. Uh, the fact his gospel runs parallel with the other three at only 8% suggests that John was quite familiar with the other three writings. And a larger percentage of the Gospel of John is unique material. And I think that was because, who remembers, who remembers how John always described himself or referred to himself? The one Jesus loved. Yeah, the, the one who Jesus loved. You know what that means, right? I'm the favorite. I'm the favorite. Yeah, John's saying, "Hey, I'm the favorite." My uh, my two grand uh, I have three granddaughters, but the two younger ones are convinced that the oldest one is my favorite. And what makes it bad is Lily goes around telling the other two. <laughs> She'll go around telling the other two, "I'm Buddy's favorite," and. She's now just about got them convinced that I have favoritism and I really don't. I try to treat all of them the same, but uh, yeah, well, and I, and I will say, you know, like you're my favorite one named Lily or my favorite one named Kenna, but uh, Lily is now 14, 14. When she was 13, we were visiting and, I was sitting there in the chair and I was real nice and comfortable. And all of a sudden she walks over to me and she said, buddy, can I sit in your lap? I said, 
sure, because I didn't expect that. And uh, we're sitting there and we're just hugging and talking and talking and hugging. And all of a sudden I looked at her and said, there's probably going to come a day when you're not going to want to do this, isn't there? <laughs> and she said, I don't see that happening anytime soon. <laughs> She'll say, I'm always going to want to sit in your lap. And I was like, I don't want to cry in front of everybody. So. <laughs> but yeah, John's saying, of all the guys that Jesus could have chosen to be his right-hand dude, it was me. I'm the favorite. And I think John actually believed it. And then it was probably solidified at the cross, right? Because Jesus could have chosen anyone. He could have looked at any one of his followers down there and said, will you take care of my mom? And he says, John, here she is. And then he said, Mary, he's going to take care of you. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Wow. Um, so uh, John's is, is very unique. John has the I am statements of Christ. I love that. Uh, the things that our world tells us we have to have, like food and light and water and uh, things like that, it had already been discussed when Jesus said, I am the bread of life or I am the light of the world or I am uh, the living water. All these things that he talks about, uh, the I am statements. And then uh, you work through that. Uh, there's the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's the fatherhood of God. Uh, there's discourses or conversations found only in John. In, in John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes by night. Now we know John chapter 3 because of John 3.16. But sometimes we forget that Nicodemus was a learned individual. Nicodemus was among uh, the Pharisees, a, a part of the Sanhedrin. He was a learned individual, but he knew he was still lacking something. But he didn't want everybody else to know that he was still searching. So he comes to Jesus at night in quiet. And uh, they had this great conversation or the one in the next chapter, the woman at the well, or, or the parable of the good shepherd, uh, or after the resurrection when he meets with the disciples at the Sea of Galilee. Most of you remember that story, right? <coughs> they're out fishing and they're not having any luck. And then they realize it's Jesus when they've caught this load of fish. What else is unique about that story? Peter jumps out of the boat and gets to the shore as quickly as possible. I said he did that because he didn't want to do be responsible for having to row back to the shore. <laughs> yeah, he won the easy way out. But no, he was so anxious to see Jesus. I have a question. Did he discuss about Joseph not being there during the crucifixion? Away Most people think that Joseph died real early, oh. even before uh, uh, Jesus reached the year of maturity, which would have been 30. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, most people believe that because he's not mentioned after uh, Mary and Joseph forgot him uh, there in Luke 2, uh, that he must have died sometime right after the age of 12. And so that's why you only read about Mary and his brothers going to rescue him or Mary and his brothers going to reach him, uh, that Joseph probably had already passed away. He was a lot older than Mary. More than likely. I mean, nobody knows significant, uh, for sure, but because of the age that most men married versus the age that most women married, Joseph was probably significantly older. Yeah. 
Any other questions or thoughts? Yeah. Right. Luke was an investigator. When you read the first four verses of the Gospel of Luke and the first uh, few verses of the book of Acts, Luke talks about how he had investigated. So I liken it to an attorney ready for a trial. And it says that he was investigating this for somebody by the name of Theophilus. Now there is a group that thinks that that was an individual and there's a group that thinks that Theophilus is uh, in response to the church at, at large or people at large. I personally think he was doing it on behalf of an individual that he was trying to lead to Christ. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. But so he was digging deep. He, he was uncovering. And, and I liken it to somebody like uh, Josh McDowell or Lee Strobel, individuals who were not believers initially, and then they decide that they're going to show the world that Jesus was not true or real. And they do so much digging, they come to the conclusion he was who he said he was. It might not have been on that same scale, but that same type of effort. Yeah. Any other questions? Now now you've got the sun, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Just get a little bit closer, yeah. Oh, is it my blind spot or bald spot in the back? <laughs> Anybody else? Any other questions? Hey, I said this last week. I really do. I like it when people ask questions because I want to make sure you're getting uh, what you paid for. Well, that's actually nothing though, isn't it? <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> well, then you have to finish this up. Uh, the cr chronology of Christ's ministry is viewed by John. And then he, uh, I, I threw in some information concerning the Jewish festivals. A friend of mine uh, this past year in uh, uh, 2022, uh, he had several series that he was going to preach throughout the, the year. He, he plans out a year in advance. I, I do about six months. But uh, what he did is as these... Uh, great Jewish festivals appeared on the on the calendar. He would take a couple weeks off and spend time sharing with his people what these uh, foundational festivals uh, stood for. So, at the time of the Passover or the Tabernacles or the dedication, Purim, uh, we were there when he uh, talked about a couple of them, and I found that quite interesting. It was really good stuff. Uh, because most of us don't follow much of that. We know about the Passover. Uh, we know about the day of Pentecost because of the book of Acts. But uh, there's a whole lot more to those festivals than than just that. And then, uh, did everybody get a map on the next page? So that pretty much, that map gives us an understanding of the life and ministry of Christ. Uh, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, he didn't cover what we would consider a real significant area. But in that day and time, since everybody's walking, it was significant. When, when I was in Israel a long time ago now, uh, I had made my way to uh, down into some of the region of Samaria, uh, into Jerusalem. We, we visited Jerusalem. I spent most of my time in Cana and Nazareth with our churches there. And uh, it, it, was, it was an enjoyable uh, adventure for me. But uh, to be able to go through and walk in areas where Jesus would have been uh, so many years ago, it, it, was, it, it was really uh, a, great, a great joy. Has anybody in here ever been to Israel? Anybody? Uh, I, I was so excited to be able to go, and uh, it was awesome. I had uh, uh, my own personal tour guide, uh, the, the gentleman that I accompanied because he wanted to make one last trip 
He had made about 20 trips before, uh, but he wanted to make one more trip before he went home. And uh, he told me story after story after story while we were there. Uh, but the, we landed in Tel Aviv and our driver picked us up and we're heading down the road and I'm sitting there in his vehicle and we pass a hitchhiker. And I said, John, uh, there's somebody needing a ride. He said, we don't want to pick him up. And I, when we got close to him, I found out why. This hitchhiker was also carrying an AK-47. And I said, well, you don't see that in Tennessee. <laughs> yeah, you don't see a hitchhiker like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it, was, it was a great trip. And uh, to be at some of those places uh, uh, where supposedly Jesus spoke the Beatitudes or to, to visit Jerusalem and uh, see some uh, significant sights there. Uh, it was it was pretty amazing. It was good stuff. Any any other questions? Because we got two minutes. Is that right? Two minutes. Anybody? Well, I appreciate uh, your participation. Uh, next week we're going to uh, look at it a little more in depth. Uh, the birth. Uh, of Christ and work our way through uh, as far as we can get through that uh, second uh, section. Maybe we'll get there towards uh, the death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, but uh, there's uh, lots of material, so it, it would benefit you if you uh, have time this week to read through it in preparation. That way, maybe you'll find something you want to ask a question about or uh, get more detail on. You can do that. And uh, we can uh, help out with those things. But it's all about uh, Jesus and uh, getting ready for his ministry. Uh, Easter is just around the corner. Uh, sunrise uh, service at 7 o'clock with breakfast to, to follow. Uh, worship. Uh, there's still some of the pamphlets out there. If you'd like to pick some of those up and uh, invite some people uh, to worship. Uh, there are two times every year that people will respond in a positive way uh, to an invitation for church, Easter and Christmas. Uh, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, I really don't. But the thinking of a lot of people who are not Christians, people who are not uh, committed uh, or have a church home, but when those holidays roll around, part of them says, well, we have to go to church somewhere. I'm, I'm just being honest because uh, I've talked to those people. And, and so if they feel, have that feeling, well, I have to go somewhere. My feeling is it might as well be here. So be bold to say, here's what we're doing and uh, invite them to come. Uh, I think I have my family uh, coming, uh, uh, an individual I talked with, and he uh, he indicated that he and his wife and two children uh, would be here. Uh, so I'm sure most of you know somebody like that. Uh, I think it'd be great if we, see, we had 80-something, I think it was 80-something Sunday. <laughs> if, it'd be great if we had 160-something on uh, Easter That'd be a step in the right direction. So, anybody else? Anyone? Okay. Dave, would you uh, pray for us, please? Dear Lord, we thank you for this study that we have. And we just pray that you continue to watch over us and guide us as we walk through our daily walks of life. We just thank you for this building that we can meet in as a church and we just pray that you continually watch over us and guide us for those that we need to talk to and those that we have talked to, that they receive the need to accept you as a personal Savior. This we send you pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.